All right, church, let's take our seat. And this morning, we are going to take some time to come back to the book of Job as we're going to study together uh, from this second mini-series that we have begun here about the silence of God. And when I tell you about the silence of God, what we understand is that this is a book, the book of Job, that has reminded us in the first couple of chapters of what it looks like when your world gets turned upside down. In other words, everything that Job had was taken away in one day. All of his possessions, all of his children, I mean, just again, envision in one day of your life burying 10 of your children in one day, 10 fresh graves around your house. And then your wife comes along beside you as Mrs. Job did and says to him, listen, why don't you just curse God, blame him, Tell him it's, he's done wrong, it's his fault, so you can die and this will all be over. But Job doesn't do that. The book of Job doesn't end after those first two chapters. The book of Job begins to show us how to deal with this struggle that we go through often like Job did, not knowing why this happened. And as you will remember, when we looked last week at the first message in this mini-series, we learned the very important thing that Job found some good friends who were called comforters who came to him. That section in chapter 2 that we began with last week in verse 11 says that when Job's three friends heard of this adversity, the news had spread, people were talking about what Job was going through, and three of his friends got together, sacrificed their time, sacrificed their resources, and just came to be with him and spend time with him. They were literally the best comfort Job could have had at that time. And so Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar care for him. They feel for his suffering. And for seven days and seven nights, they don't sit on the back porch sipping coffee and running their Keurig and eating all the great snacks around the house. They are together in a trash dump for seven days and seven nights entering into the struggle of Job. And that's what true friends do. Friends don't run away from people when they're having hard times, when they're unexplainable hard times, when they're struggling. They get right into the thick of it and the mess of it. And that's what Job's friends did. But Job's friends, though they have sat with him for seven days, Job is very tormented. In chapter 3, that chapter opened up with this reminder here. After they sat with him for seven days and seven nights, Job opened his mouth. And wow, what came out of his mouth? It's not that Job is not blessing God and thanking him as he did in the chapters before. It's not that he's not recognizing that God is good and God is sovereign. He still sees all that, but he is just twisted sideways. He he, he just can't put his mind around why this is all going on. It's part of the the silence that he struggles with here. God, for 30-some chapters in this book of Job, is not going to talk to him and give him any insight for 30-some chapters. It's like Job is saying, Lord, I know that you give and I know that you take away and I know that you're good and I know that you are sovereign. I just cannot explain what's going on. It doesn't add up in my mind. And so as you remember last week, we saw that Job's sorrow in the midst of the silence comes out in that chapter when he tells us things like he wished he'd have never been born. He just wished he would have never had a birthday because if he didn't, live and was born and none of this would ever been his experience. Job wished also in that chapter that had he been born that he just wouldn't go on living. And finally at the end of the chapter as we ended in chapter 3 last week he's just wishing for death. Just any day. Just, just let me die. And some of us as Christians we look at that and we go shame on you Job. And in so doing we really reveal something that we do not understand. And that is there is a place in God's people's lives for this thing called suffering that's not tied to any wrong they have done. And when you are in that position and you cannot wrap your mind around why things are going as they are, your heart and mind will be flooded with all kind of questions, with all kind of struggles, filled with the why kind of concepts that float through your mind. And I'm not telling you Job is right. We don't draw a theology from chapter 3 and say, you know, that's the way we're supposed to respond. I'm just telling you that's the real experience. And Job is trying to make sense of his experience. And that brings us to where we are this morning in chapter 4. Because as we turn to chapter 4, the book of Job takes a bad, bad turn. 
Notice how chapter 4, verse 1 begins. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered. Remember I told you he's got three friends, that Eliphaz is probably the oldest and he's probably the spokesman for the group. And he steps up and he says something. You should circle that word somewhere in your notes or in your Bible because this is a turning point. Something dramatically changes now in the book of Job. Here these friends have been with him. Here they have genuinely loved him and cared for him and listened to him and cried with him and just spent time with him. Now they're going to say something. I want to just underscore a very, very important thing. Often we say that, you know, I just want to be a friend to somebody and I just want to kind of love them and care for them and let them know I'm there, what's often referred to by people as the ministry of presence, just being present, and that's a good thing, but friendship doesn't stop at that point. Friendship doesn't just say, I'm just going to be there and listen, and I'm never going to say anything. Now, the problem with Job's friends is though they know friends do speak to each other, and friends do talk about the struggles and try to help them in the struggles, what Job's friends have done is all wrong. Everything about what they say really is, is not right. Job's friends stand, as it were, in chapters 4 going forward, and there's going to be long chapters and cycles of them telling Job what they think, but they are a reminder to us. They shout at us, as it were, don't treat your friends like this when they're going through trials. Don't be like them. You say, well, I thought they were, they were friends. They are their friends. They are genuine friends. They just have a bad theology when it comes to trials and suffering. His friends are not going to say heretical things to him. They are not going to tell Job false doctrine. They're actually going to say some things that are really right and really true. But their doctrine is unbalanced and that they don't know how to apply it in the midst of Job's suffering. And so Eliphaz is going to be the first one to step up and he is going to speak. And what he is going to reveal is that he doesn't think soundly and rightly about suffering. And we'll see that as it unfolds for us this morning here. I love the way Douglas O'Donnell describes what happens now in chapter 4. He writes, We might think the testing of Job is over, but alas, there is one final test, perhaps the toughest of all the tests. Satan slithers away in chapters 1 and 2 while Job's closest companions cozy up. <laughs> That's the picture. In the footnotes, by the way, interestingly, I found in the 1560 Geneva Bible, interesting, it says there of this passage in the footnotes, these friends came unto him under pretense of consolation, and yet they tormented him more than in all his sufferings. Isn't that amazing? You got the picture in the first couple of chapters of Job sitting there. He's lonely. He's by himself. He's broken out in, in bulls and pusses oozing out of his body. He feels horrible. Life looks horrible. Everything seems to be messed up. Only thing he can do is scratch himself to try to relieve some pain. And yet, as the Geneva Bible notes and as Douglas O'Donnell is describing for us here, these people become more of a pain to him than all that other suffering. So they, they, Job's three friends now, become, as it were, a strong warning to us, don't follow their example. Don't be like them. This is not good. Now, this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the first of these. We're going to cover four chapters this morning. And I know some of you must have looked at the notes you have there and you must have said, he must have made a mistake there. Four chapters, that's 99 verses here. I remember when Josiah this week texted me and he said, Dad, so what is the passage you're going to cover in Job today? <laughs> and I texted him back. I said, chapters 4 to chapter 7 so he could work on the music and make it all fit together for this morning's service. He texted me back and he said, in one week? Just in one sermon? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm going I'm to take, I'm going I'm to have a hope and believe that maybe you've already read chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7. And you just kind of just, made your way through that and just kind of saw what's going on in this first round of conversations that Eliphaz is having with his friends. So here's what I want to do to help us get through these chapters in the next 30 minutes or so. 
uh, but we will be done by 12. I want to help you see, first of all, the big picture of these speeches and what his friends are doing and what they're saying. And then I want to come back and look at specifically how Eliphaz in his first address to Job um, was saying some things to him that we need to be very cautious about whenever we begin to try to help others in suffering. So if you got your notes there, let's look at the speeches, what Job's friends said. As I've told you, these speeches are the big part of the book of Job, and they're going to go from chapter 4 to chapter 37. So there's like this cycle that you're going to see. And in your notes, I've already put them for you. It's easy to look at. It won't take us but a minute to underscore this. But there are four different cycles that show up in the book of Job. Eliphaz will speak, for example, in chapters 4 and 5, which we're going to look at in a moment. And Job is going to respond to what he says in chapters 6 and 7. Bildad will say something. Job will respond. Zophar will say something. And so he will respond. And that will be like the first conversation they've had. And then in the second session, the same thing will happen, the third session. And then interestingly, as you come to chapter 32, there's a young guy named Elihu. And Elihu is the one that's going to come in after all of Job's three friends have presented their cases and described why they think Job is going through what he is going through. He's going to come in and he's going to offer his young person's perspective on that. It's going to be interesting when we get there. But let me kind of help you think a little bit about here the content of what all these speeches are ultimately about. They ultimately, all three of them, and even the final one, is going to say the same exact thing in essence. I don't mean that, that they're just mimicking and parroting what the other person says. What I mean is that when you boil it down to it, there are basically just a, about three things that these three guys are saying. And here's the first one. They're saying, Job, you would agree, wouldn't you, that God is in absolute control. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you? And everybody here is a Christian would say, yeah, that's right. Chapter 1 and 2 was so clear that, that though Satan is the immediate one going after Job and causing him all this trouble, in the end, God is the ultimate cause and therefore God is in control. So, Job, you agree with that, right? That's kind of what all those speeches are going to say. Number two, you would agree, wouldn't you, Job, that God is just and fair. I mean, he's not going to do anything that's wrong. I mean, that's not even possible for him. You know, the New Testament describes it like this. In him is light and there is, what? No darkness at all. God, I mean, God can't do anything wrong. So, Job, you would agree with that, right? That God is in control and that God is just and he is fair. Thirdly, therefore, this is the conclusion we must come to then, Job. God blesses righteousness and punishes wickedness. Here's the answer to that one. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. It is here that their unbalanced theology starts coming out. It is here that their orthodoxy, they have a right statement, but it doesn't apply in every situation, shows up. And in your notes there, I want you to know, Hilly, what I've described this as. His friends have a rigid, cold cause and effect theology. I mean, every time we look at something, we can always figure out why it's happening. If you do right things, then guess what? Good things happen to you. But if you do bad things, guess what? Bad things happen to you. I want to say again, sometimes, but not always. And that is the quandary that Job's friends are going to find themselves in when Job will say, but I didn't do anything wrong. It doesn't make sense to me, as Francis Anderson says, the friends must infer from Job's suffering that he has sinned if we take this cause and effect kind of thinking. And Job must infer from his innocent that God is unjust. You see, there's all kind of troubles with living with a cause and effect ultimate kind of thinking, particularly when it comes to suffering. Christopher Ash summarizes it like this. So the comforters make this big mistake. Job does not need to repent for any sin that he has led to his suffering. He's not being punished for sin. To say that he, he is adds a cruel burden to his grief. Yet the comforters say exactly that for nine chapters. 
That's a cause and effect theology. I love the insight that Francis Anderson adds to this context of Job's friends and what they say. He writes, men seek an explanation of suffering in cause and effect. You need to just kind of let that settle in for a minute. We as human beings, we as Christians, we as people always are seeking explanation to suffering in cause and effect. They look backwards, he writes, for a connection between prior sin and present suffering. The Bible, however, looks forward in hope and seeks explanations, not so much in its origins as in its goals. And that's a profound statement he just said. We always are looking back saying, I wonder what they did. We look back for a cause and an effect. But the scripture is not always giving us an answer for the suffering and the trial. But it's always causing us to seek purpose and goals that God may have. He writes, Francis Anderson does, the purpose of suffering is seen not in its cause, but in its result. Really, really important. You see, this is the kind of thinking, the unbiblical thinking that we tend to have if we are not careful. Because if you run that kind of concept out, cause and effect theology, that means if all wrong in our li- we have in our life means we have sinned, then just the opposite must be true. If everything is going good, then I must be okay. It goes both ways. This is the way we all naturally think. I, w- I was actually thinking of one of my favorite movies. I I know you're going to think this is crazy that a guy likes this movie. (laughs) But one of my favorite movies, I've watched this musical, I don't know how many times. I've seen it performed live in my life, and it is the sound of music. That's okay. You can just think I'm a little little weird that a guy likes this. But I'm telling you, there is one scene in there that just reveals exactly this kind of naturalistic, wrong, unbalanced theology. You remember when Captain Von Trapp told Maria how much he loved her. And she sings this little song. It goes like this. I'm not singing it, but I'm going to read it to you. She says, perhaps I had a wicked childhood. Perhaps I had a miserable youth. But somewhere in my wicked, miserable past, there must have been a moment of truth. For here you are standing there loving me, whether or not you should. So somewhere in my youth or childhood... I must have done something good. Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. That's why I have Captain Von Trapp. Because I did good. And that's the natural thinking. This is a good thing, so I must have done good. I love the way Lucy in the Peanuts uh, cartoon says to Charlie Brown, She says, there's one thing you're going to have to learn, buddy. You reap what you sow. You get out of life what you put into it. No more and no less. And Snoopy, as he's always over in the corner muttering, says, I'd kind of like to see a little margin for error. (laughs) (laughs) But Job's counselors do not have a margin for error. There is no place for them to think somebody could actually be going through troubles And they didn't do something wrong. Because if you do bad, bad things happen. If you do good, good things happen. And I want to show you in that verse I listed for you there that even the disciples of Jesus had this cause and effect kind of theology in their head. Remember that time when they are passing by in John chapter 9 and as they passed by, the text says, they saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he would be born blind. That's called cause and effect theology. What that means is, that kid's blind, somebody did something wrong. Were these guys right in their cause and effect theology? Absolutely not. Jesus said, neither one of them did. And you know they're scratching their head going, now that does not make sense to me. What do you mean? A bad thing could happen to somebody that didn't do anything wrong? That's the theology that Job's friends cannot understand and they cannot get. Now listen, let me just put a little side note in here. So nobody calls me this week and says, but pastor, you know the Bible says whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. Uh, Yes, I do. 
And listen carefully. If you are sinning in your marriage, if you're being dishonest, if you're looking at porn, if you're drinking, if you're lying, if you're doing all those things and your world is falling apart, guess what? That is why you're probably experiencing all of that. But this is not the case with Job, and it's not the case in every case. Just looking at someone and saying, that must be the conclusion. I conclude that God is in control, he's just and he's fair, and if things are going bad, you must be a wicked person. That's not always the case. See, Job's friends had no theology for this thing called innocent suffering in their lives. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm confused here because doesn't the Bible in the Old Testament teach us this thing called the blessing and cursing? Doesn't it say in the book of Deuteronomy that God said to Israel, if you obey my commands, then I will bless you? And he lists all these things that will go well in the land for them. No miscarriages, crops won't fail, cattle will be the best in the land, on and on and on. But if you don't obey me, then I will curse you. And then God says in that section in Deuteronomy to them, so choose this day, blessing or cursing. And you say, see, that there it is. That's right there. If you do the right thing, God gives you this good stuff. And if you do bad, he causes you to suffer. Again, that's more of a reaping and sowing principle. It doesn't in any way say that there can't be suffering that comes in someone's life and they haven't done wrong and they are not cursed and under judgment of, of God. So that's kind of where they were thinking and all of their conversations with Job, their speeches, they are basically saying this, God is in control, God is just and God is fair and therefore he blesses the righteous and he punishes the wicked. Job, you must be wicked. You must have done wrong. Now I want to show you something that I found very interesting. As they say, Job has sinned and God is punishing him. How do you think Job responds to that? How do you think Job thinks of that? In each of these cases, here's exactly what happens. Job is not impressed with their counsel. I found this somewhat hilarious as I was reading through the book of Job. And Job, for example, in chapter 6, verses 14 to 30, describes his counselors, his friends, as someone that he had hoped would bring him refreshment, but they were like a riverbed that was nothing but a bunch of dry dust. In chapter 12, verse 2, there's incredible sarcasm that he levels at them. He says, no doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you. Oh, yes, you are so wise. You are, you are where wisdom is at. When you die, I'm really worried that there won't be any wise people left in the world. <laughs> he describes them again in chapter 16 and those references I've given you there. He describes them as miserable comforters. That's what you are, he says. And in chapter 16, verse 3, he calls them a bunch of windbags and wishes they would just shut up. You didn't know that kind of good stuff was in the Bible, did you? That was right there. See, Job is like, what you're telling me is not right. It does not add up. Cause and effect kind of theology is not really how to think about suffering. But even worse than the fact that Job is not impressed with their counsel, God is not impressed. God is not impressed with their counsel. At the end here of the book of Job in chapter 42, verse 7, as we look forward God calls them together, these men, these three, and he speaks directly to Eliphaz, who is the leader, the first spokesman, and he says, quote, The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right. Wow. I mean, this is, this is bad news. That God's mad at you because of the way you talk to one of his kids. Because when they were suffering, you said some things that totally misrepresented him. And so Job's friends, I want to tell you again, at this point, stand as a warning and a caution. Make sure that you don't talk to those who are suffering in the ways that they did. You say, well, how did they talk? Well, that leads us to the second point. The first speech we discover here from Eliphaz in chapters 4 and 7, and we get to see Job's response. Now, I'm going to go through this rather quickly because, again, I'm going to trust you've read it. It's very poetic in what it says and how it describes things here, so it'll be easy for us just to get the picture. Look with me in chapter 4 at how Eliphaz 
speaks to Job. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered, if one ventures a word with you, will you become impatient? You know, that's kind of like him saying, you're not going to get mad at me, are you? I'm not going to hurt your feelings if I say this to you, or am I? If one ventures a word with you, will you become impatient? But who can refrain from speaking? I just can't keep my mouth shut, he says. I've got to say something to you. Behold, verse 3, you have admonished many and you have strengthened weak hands. Your words have held the tottering to stand and you have strengthened feeble knees. Here's what this is. This first response here is he pretends that his Eliphaz to be concerned. It's almost as if Eliphaz is saying to him, listen, come on, Joe. You've talked to all kind of people and been an encourager to them. You've really let them know that you care about them. But Job, when it comes to this, why don't you just comfort your own soul? Why don't you just comfort your own soul? Now listen very carefully to a very, very important truth. Whenever a person is going through trials, unexplainable suffering, the last thing they are most often able to do is encourage their own soul. It's almost like he's saying to Job here, why don't you just kind of buck it up, buddy? Pull yourself together. I mean, what do you expect me to do? You know how to do this thing. Encourage your own soul. And Job is struggling here with the fact that he's not getting real concern. His friends now are not concerned for him like they should be. It pretends to be concern. Eliphaz is somewhat being hard and cold and cruel to him at this point and just telling him that you need to pull yourself together, Job. I mean, you would think at this point, this is where Eliphaz or the friend would say, hey, you've been encouraging a lot of people, Job. Now it's my time to do that for you. It's my time to help you through this trial. So there's not real genuine concern here. If we want to learn a lesson from this, that really people who have a tit-for-tack kind of theology, a cause-and-effect thinking, don't really have a real genuine concern for people. They don't know how to be concerned for people because it's just so simple and black and white. You do good, good things happen. You do wrong, bad things happen. And so there's not really genuine concern here. If you go down in verses 7 to 11, you will note here the second point is that he personally condemns Job. Look at verse 7. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent? It's a question to Job. Have you ever known anybody who, who perished who was innocent? Or where were the upright destroyed? According to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. Really, what are you saying, Jim? Zach, excuse me, not Jim and not Zach. <laughs> I looked out there and saw them, but Job. <laughs> hey, this is how we talk to each other, right? <laughs> Pastors and elders. Hey, buddy, that's not right. <laughs> so what, what he is saying to Job, Eliphaz is saying, listen, man, you deserve what you're getting. He's just condemning him. You can't show me anybody who has ever had bad things go wrong in their life that didn't do something wrong. So he condemns him, straight out condemns him. See, in Eliphaz's mind, sin equals suffering and suffering equals judgment. That's the way it works. Just note, let your eyes fall down to verses 9 through 11. By the breath of God, they perish. And they... And by the blast of his anger, they come to an end. The roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The lion perishes for lack of prey and the whelps of the lions are scattered. In other words, God just gets you for what you've done. That's the picture of the poetry there. So not only is Eliphaz pretending to be concerned, he's not genuinely concerned. He's telling Job just to pull it together. He personally condemns him thirdly he expresses proud condescension. He expresses proud condescension in verses 12 to 21. I just want to highlight just a few of these. Look at verse 12. Now a word was brought to me. This is Eliphaz speaking. 
Now, a word was brought to me stealthily. In other words, secret word. I got a secret word here. And my ear received a whisper of it. The text literally is saying here, like I heard this still quiet voice talking to me. Verse 13, amid disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, dread came upon me and trembling and made all my bones shake. Well, what is Eliphaz saying here? I got a special word from God for you. That's what he's talking about. I got a vision. I got a dream. I saw something that nobody else has seen. <laughs> and so what he's expressing here is a sense of condescension. As if to say, I got something you don't, my friend. You're over there crying out to God. Why is this happening? What's going on? Well, the Lord showed me in a dream. The Lord gave me a word. I had a vision. He spoke to me. And I've got the inside track now. I know what is going on. Now, let me just tell you something about that kind of language. Anytime somebody says that to me, that kind of frightens me in the sense that I don't even know how to respond. If, I, if it really is God, <laughs> I mean, who's going to say, uh, I'm not going to listen to that, right? I mean, just that language that Christians tend to use about, hey, God told me something and God showed me something. God wants me to tell you something. You kind of go, wait a minute, I'm going to back up. In fact, a little later on in this conversation, Eliphaz is going to say to Job, God has caused me to see that the reason your children died is because you were doing something wrong. I mean, what parent wouldn't stand back and say, oh my goodness, what does God know? What has God showed you? That's the kind of language that is going on here. Um, and that's always the trouble with people who try to get a word outside of this word. When they try to add something to the revelation and wisdom of God's word, they're always going to bring this kind of despair and condescension on others. Some of you may remember one time we, in this building right here, a guy walked in one day and he said, I'm here because the Lord told me, gave me a word and told me to come preach here today. Well, you know what everybody did. They went and found Pastor Kevin. Go get him, let him deal with this. And so he said, hey, I'm here today. The Lord gave me a word and... He told me to come preach here today. And I said, well, I'm sorry. He didn't tell me. And besides, we already have a word. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 4 this morning. Oh, he became condescending and angry and kicking the dust off of his feet, as it were, as he walked out of this place as if we had rejected the very word of God. This is what his friend is doing here to him. Eliphaz is being condescending to him. Not only that, the last thing is he gives all kind of perverted counsel to him. And that's usually what happens when you get away from the word, when you get away from the truth of scripture, the secret thing God's revealed to you and shown you, you are going to, in chapter 5, as Eliphaz does, begin to give all kind of crazy and wrong counsel. Let me just kind of highlight a few of those for you. In verse uh, 8 of chapter 5, just drop down there. But as for me, I would seek God and I would place my cause before God. Here's, here's what Eliphaz is saying. Listen, Job, all you got to do is quit playing this game. Just say you've done wrong. Tell God you're sorry. Take your, take your punishment and it'll all go away. That's not good counsel when you haven't done something wrong. Just find something to confess. Just, just look for it. You'll find it. It's got to be there. In fact, if you go on in the rest of the chapter and you look maybe down in verse 19 you'll see that uh, he promises him six things that will definitely happen to him if he'll just say he's done wrong. Verse 19, from six troubles he will deliver you. Even in seven, evil will not touch you. In famine he will redeem you from death and in war from the power of the sword. You will be hidden from the scourge of the tongue and you will not be afraid of violence when it comes. You will laugh at violence and famine and you will not be afraid of wild beasts for you will be in a league with the stones of the field and the beast of the field will be at peace with you. You will know that your tent is secure for you will visit your abode and fear no loss. You will know also that your descendants will be many and your offsprings as the grass of the earth. You will come to the grave in full vigor like the striking of grain in it like the stacking of grain in its season you know what he's saying listen Job if you would just say you did wrong and agree with what I'm telling you then what's going to happen is famine defeat and war physical abuse and violence harm from the wild beast financial loss barrenness and earthly death is all going to kind of leave you and 
fact, he ends in verse 26 by telling him that you're not even going to get sick before you die. Verse 27, it's as if he is saying, we've investigated this and we are telling you the truth. Hear it and know it for yourself. Just listen. God is going to protect you. Listen, this is the promise of a prosperity that comes outside of God's word and outside of God's wisdom and the answer that people need to hear whenever they are going through suffering. So, those are rigid words. Cold, as it were, very rigid, very cold, very hard words to be said to him that are really built around cause and effect. Cause and effect. Let's end by looking lastly at this. How does Job respond to this? This just blew me away. I mean, he's got his moments of sarcasm. He's got his moments of really setting the record straight throughout the book of Job. But how does he respond at this point? Well, let's look at that. The response of Job comes in chapter 6, verse 2, Eliphaz. First of all, he apologizes for some of his rash comments. I'm kidding you. I'm kidding you. This is like beyond my wildest imaginations. In spite of being in the agony he is in, in spite of the wrong counsel and the rigid, cold way they have treated him, Job basically says, I am sorry for some of the ways I've said some of the things that I have said. Look at verse six, chapter 6, verse 1. Then Job answered, Oh, that my grief were actually weighed and laid in the balance together with my calamity, for then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words have been rash. Did you get what he's saying? He said, more of a weight on me is kind of like not just my calamity, but as it were, my grief. I'm just so grieved. I've actually said some things I wished I hadn't have said. So Job begins to apologize. Number two, Job, not after he apologizes, admits his real condition in verses 4 through 13. Just again, a couple notes to highlight in that. Look at verse Four of chapter 6. For the errors of the Almighty are within me. Their poison my spirit drinks. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. He goes on and he describes in this chapter that some of the ways he is feeling is as if he has no strength at all. It's like he says, I am not, as it were, some strong bronze man. I'm not able to handle this and, and, and I'm admitting that this is really hard for me. The third thing that goes on is he appeals to Eliphaz for some real compassion in verses 14 through 23. He says here, verse 14, For the despairing man there should be kindness from his friend so that he does not forsake the fear of the Almighty. You could help me honor God in this, he's saying. But what you've done has really not helped me to honor God and I'm appealing that you would give me some real genuine compassion. Speak the truth to me. Help me think rightly about this. But he's not doing that. And lastly, he asks for real correction. Notice in chapter 6, verse 24. Teach me and I will listen. I'll be silent, he says, and show me how I have erred. Show me where I have gone wrong. I mean, an error means here unknowingly. I don't, I don't know if I did, but if I did... Show me. So he's apologizing that I got a little out of control because it's so hard. This is weighing on me like sand. I don't know if you've ever thought about how heavy grief would be if it's like sand just on you. He admits how hard this is, his real struggle. He appeals that he'd have a true friend to really show him real compassion. And he says, if I've done wrong, correct me. Show me real correction, and I want that. That is the godliness of Job even when his friends are telling him all the wrong things. There's one final thing, and we, we'll be done. Job responds to God here in chapter 7. As I said, the cycles are always this way. One of the friends will say something for a chapter or two, and Job will respond back for a chapter or two. And what does Job do here? Well, here's what he does. Verses 1 to 5, he mourns his condition. Just notice this. Is not man forced to labor on earth? And are not his days like the days of a hired man? As a slave who pants for the shade, and as a hired man who eagerly waits for the, his wages, 
So I am allotted months of vanity and nights of trouble are appointed me. That's just called mourning. This is just hard again. He's not only told his friend that, he's now telling God. And listen, part of Christianity that we so easily get off balance on is that trying to hide what we really struggle with, right? We have 150 psalms, and in those psalms, we have 150 psalms telling us that God's people struggle in every imaginable way. And Job is being honest there. He mourns his suffering. Secondly, he mentions the shortness of his life in verses 6 through 16. Let me just read verse 5. He says, My flesh is clothed with worms and a crust of dirt. My skin hardens and ruins. Just more pictures of his mourning and his suffering. And in verses 6 through 16, he describes for them just how uh, he here realized life is going to be short. It's not going to last long. And finally, he misses his communion with God. He misses his communion with God. Look, if you will, at that last actual Statement there in verse 20 of chapter 7. Have I sinned? What have I done to you? He's talking to God. Oh, watcher of men, why have you, God, set me as your target so that I am burdened to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust. And you will seek me, but I will not be. In other words, he's saying, I don't know where God is. And, and, and I miss that, God, more than anything. I can't make sense of the suffering. I can't make sense of the struggle. I just don't know how to process this. And Job's friends, the first one, Eliphaz, warns us of this in very, very important application. Make sure, and this is where we're going to wrap it up today, make sure that you do not fall into the trap of the impulse kind of thinking that always tries to pin down the cause for the suffering. Make sure. Again, we're not talking about sowing. We're not talking about someone who's absolutely done some sin and we know they're going to have to work through the consequences of those sins. But be careful when you deal with those who have suffered loss Loss of children, loss of home, loss of family. You name the loss and there, there's just nothing that you can find and they can find that really has gone wrong in their life. Make sure that you don't give the impulse response to always say, there's got to be a cause. We'll find it. Got to be. Because if you do that, here's what will happen. You will experience not only as the one who is going through that, the crushing sorrow of never getting an answer to what's the cause of this. But you will also, if you do that, be an added source of conflict and struggle to them. We've got to be sure that we don't act like the Eliphaz and really add more to their grief than they've already encountered. Tim Keller puts it very well when he says, we cannot deduce the spiritual state of a man or a woman from their current happiness or prosperity or their present sufferings. The fact of this ignorance needs to be burned into our conscience. I mean, think of this, brothers and sisters. Had you not read the whole Bible and you had run across the Apostle Paul who had just spent a night and a day in the ocean, beaten, starving to death, and broke, if you took the approach of Job's friends, you would have been saying, man, look, this guy must really be out of the will of God. And yet Job is, I mean, and yet Paul is right in the middle of God's will. You see, you can't draw conclusions about the spiritual state of anybody based on external stuff. Not ultimately. You cannot do that. So avoid that. Be careful that we do not do that. I read the words of Derek Kidner to you because he puts it very well and very strongly to us. He says, the basic error of Job's friends is that they overestimate their grasp of truth, misapply the truth they know, and close their minds to any facts that contradict what they assume. 
That being so, if the book is attacking anything, its target is not the familiar doctrines such as God's justice and benevolence, his care for the righteous and punishment of the wicked, or the general law that what one sows one reaps. Rather, this book attacks the arrogance of pontificating about the application of these truths and of thereby misrepresenting God and misjudging one's fellow man. To put it more positively, the book shows by its context, the opening scene in heaven, how small a part of any situation is the fragment that we see. How much of what we do see we ignore or distort through preconceptions and how unwise it is to extrapolate from our elementary grasp of truth. Don't think you know it. Don't think you got it figured out. That's what he is saying. So as those who are giving counsel, be very careful. Don't emulate Eliphaz. Those who are seeking counsel, those who are trying to make sense of why they're going through the struggle, here's what Job is going to see. He's going to learn. He's struggling through it right now. And this is going to be a hard thing for you and I to really get. And that is coming to a place to where you are comfortable with mystery. Comfortable with mystery. This past December, I had the privilege to spend three days with some other pastors and friends with Johnny Erickson Tata. And we were talking, and and I asked her this question. I said, how do you work through as a quadriplegic? I mean, it's just beyond my comprehension what day in and day out life is like for this woman. Can't feed herself, can't dress herself, can't go to the bathroom herself. Lays in the bed at night, breaking out in sweats and the whole bed becoming just soaked with. Have to get up in the middle of the night and they change it. And I asked her, I said, so how do you put together the mystery of God in your suffering? And you know what she said? She said, said, Kevin, that is a very insightful question because that's just what it is, mystery. And what I am after is no longer trying to figure out the cause and the why What I'm after is purpose. What's God want to do in this, in my life? How does he want to use me? What does he want to accomplish in me? And we as Christians, if we're on the side of needing counsel, needing to to deal with the suffering and the why questions, we have got to come to the place to where we are comfortable with mystery. I'm not going to ask the why questions and try to figure it out anymore. I've asked all I can ask. I'm going to now ask the purpose question. What's the goal here? What's the purpose? What is God intending to do? What does he want to accomplish in my life? That's that's what Job's going to learn. He didn't get it from his friends, but hopefully as a true friend to someone, you'll help them see that and point them in that direction. Let me close with a story that I was reading about this week. I love to read the stories of the old hymn writers, and we all know of one blind hymn writer named Fanny Crosby. But there's another one you may not know the name of and may not understand his life. His name is George Matheson. And George Matheson was a teenager that he learned that he was going blind and he eventually became blind. But he went on and he finished school, graduated from school and college. And by the time he was 20 years old, he totally blind, couldn't see anything. His sisters joined him and helped him learn Greek and Hebrew so they could assist him in his study and his preaching. Now that's the kind of sister to have right there. I'm going to study Greek and Hebrew, I'm telling you. When they passed on, or they were no longer in his life to help him do that, he found a woman that he was engaged to be married to and once she realized what life with a blind man was going to be like, she broke off the engagement like to destroy him. He never married. The pain of that rejection never totally left him. He entered the ministry and served in the pastorate for 31 years as a blind pastor. After his youngest sister married, leaving him entirely alone, George Matheson became overwhelmed with sorrow. But instead of sitting in sorrow and asking why, 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 he started looking for purpose. And God's plan. And here is what he penned. And it's the song we're going to sing in just a moment. Oh love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. 
I give thee back the life I owe that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O oh, joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be. O oh, cross that lifteth up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead and from the ground there blossoms red life that shall endless be. That's the kind of place you get when you are content with mystery. Not looking for the cause always as if I can figure out why this happened, but I'll be okay with mystery and I'll look for God's purpose in the midst of it. That's where I hope we come to. That's where I hope the people you try to advise and shepherd and care for come to in their suffering. Let's pray together. Thank you.